and uh, how many people can go up on stage in their t-shirt and jeans and put on an amazing show. I, I always felt like it should be a visual too. And I, I, I hope there's a day I can take it even further than we, what we did in Mushroom as far as the visual and um, it takes money and everything, but um, things are looking up in, as far as a, having something behind us so we can do this a little more extravagantly again. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Level Up Cleveland. And this week, we have a very special guest with us as we bring in Mr. Jeffrey Nothing to the studio. How you doing, man? What's up, man? Thanks for coming down. Uh, you're welcome. It's good to be here again. Yeah, we've had L- you here. Little, but A little different looking, but yeah, than the same la- inside. Yeah, dude, it's, it's very cool because we had the other Jeffrey here the last time. We had Hatrix in here last time. Yeah. It's not the same person. It's a different person, really. I mean, it's like... Um, that was the Purgatory Hatrix days, yeah. And here, this is the Mushroom Head, and now Jeffrey Nothing days, where you were, you guys really went all out on this in this band. To uh, well, we'll get into all that. One one thing um, that's really cool about you coming down here is that you did you did dress all up for us, and you did fucking do all that stuff. And and I'm excited. I've been so excited about doing this interview. I gotta be honest with you. This is oh, gonna be awesome. yeah, man. Um, so I just want to kind of go over. The, the whole Jeffrey Nothing story, the whole Mushroom Head story, and, w- and we're going to touch back on some of the Purgatory and the Hatrix days too, just to just to give everybody a refresher in case they forgot what we talked about during the Purgatory episode, which was one of the best episodes we ever did, for sure, the Purgatory that's one. Awesome. And it went over really well. People loved that. They still talk about it all the time. Oh, that's cool. Um, but anyways, so um, the Jeffrey Nothing Project, the whole thing that you do, it's your solo. It's basically your solo thing, but... You haven't veered much away from the whole mushroom head thing also. You've kind of like in some ways continued that whole entire the horror yeah. thing that you guys did and everything, which you guys mastered. I mean, the mushroom head camp, you guys had mastered it then with the videos and everything. I mean, every video was like a horror movie. On top of the music, you guys were able to visually dominate. I mean, for sure. That was like, you know. Thanks for that. I, I just always felt um, there's a thousand bands out there that can bang their head. And uh, how many people can go up on stage in their T-shirt and jeans and put on an amazing show? I I always felt like it should be a visual too, and I I, I hope there's a day I can take it even further than we, what we did in Mushroom as far as the visual and um, it takes money and everything. But um, things are looking up in, as far as a uh, having something behind us so we can do this a little more extravagantly again. How, you know, like as far as the costumes go, you know, like that you guys had, because they changed uh, also throughout the years, you know, you guys would change costumes and, you know, it was just, it was always, always evolving kind of like thing. Yeah. Um, did you, how, how did, how did you guys acquire these? Like, like, was this something, did you, did you, did you have these things made? Did you have people that made these for you? Or did, would you guys go out into some of these stores where they had, would sell masks and be like, oh, that's cool. Or is it both? Yeah. I mean, um, the early days we, uh. We were very much DIY, and uh, that was always the case. But uh, along along the way, we had people come into our lives that made masks. And uh, I just found a new guy recently. But in the early days, we'd go to, like, Goodwill, Starship Earth, just find something that we thought would look cool. And um, we uh, went to Starship Earth and first and found the double mask. And I thought to myself, well, it would be a good contradiction, something kind of pure. So I thought of the wedding dress and then... Another day at Goodwill, there's a pair of shoulder pads laying there, and those look great. And then, <laughs> that's funny. Um, found the chemical gloves idea, which came up to pass my elbows, and it'd be so hot at some clubs that lift my arms to look cool. And somebody would be unfortunate enough to be kind of kneeling down next to me, and they get a nice hot shower. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it just kind of um, developed. And as the people would join, we'd find something where they would have something they wanted to try, and. It was a work in progress for a lot of it, and then um, there was a real charm to that old school version that was whatever was available, and then um, 
it was funny because we came up with the names and there was people down to a guy that was printing shirts for us that didn't even realize I was in the band. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, because it was like uh, we didn't want everybody to have a preconceived notion of what we were going to sound like or how the band was going to be. And so with stage names and a completely different look, people went in having no idea. So th- th- I wanted to uh, w- kind of lead up to the point where Mushroom had his form because that's a real interesting story too because it was like a whole bunch of the 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 because at that point in time Cleveland was a metal mecca I mean there were so many bands yeah. killing it at that time and you and Mushroom had was almost like a project of all these bands kind of like this guy that guy that guy you guys all picked and then it was one of them things where the project becomes bigger than everything else and then yeah that's um, kind of how well, that it was weird is um. In the early days, because we had those shows already going on, Mushroom would end up opening for Hatrix. Oh. And, um, or we'd just get a show here and there that um, would have 30 people at it before the word got out or whatever. But um, at the end of Hatrix, we'd have more people on our guest list than would pay at the door. And it was still fun to do the shows and everything, but it wasn't really growing into what I was hoping or we were or whatever. And, um, you saying Hatrix or you say you're saying Hatrix at Hatrix, the time? Yeah, Hatrix. It was. It had like a good moment, like a the Cleveland Metal Show that was free, the heavy artillery show. There was a ton of people there, and we we definitely had some good shows and opened some big shows. But until Mushroom, I, I was like a local, if not a regional band, but everything kind of blew up once that became big. Yeah, yeah, because Hatrix was. Big. I mean, you know, Purgatory never really got big. Pur- Purgatory kind of like it, got, it, it. It it was locally. Yeah, it was kind of the same thing where we never, we didn't even grasp the thought of a, getting a tour. Yeah, we were playing in Cleveland as much as possible in the area. You guys were still young at the time and stuff. Yeah, it was yeah. all it was all brand new. You know, at yeah, that you time, figure, you, you figure in those days it comes to you. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have to go out and get it like you yeah. ended up. Um, so, so yeah, let's, let's talk about some of that. Let me, let's just go right into the mushroom thing real quick, because I, I, I just find that fascinating because the guys that you had, the, the original mushroom head band is some of the most, you know, the, some of the biggest names that came out of this city at that time in the metal scene, you had the kill coins, both of them were in mushroom head. Yeah. You had JJ righteous, which was so cool. Yep. I mean, I mean, he was a, a, a great writer. I mean, I, I remember Terror. you know, like, like I remember when Terror was, coming up in the ranks and stuff and they were getting bigger and bigger locally and yeah he's he, actually the fourth member i asked jd personally to join i remember going to his house when he's like 14 and and where most people would wear like a, a team jersey or something his guitar was always around his neck i never saw him when i went to his house with his guitar on yeah he was that guy yeah and I, we actually rehearsed at level five and um the original level some five, of that yeah and some of that Band members joining happened by we were in the same location. Like Jay, Jay was rehearsing a band right across the hall. Yeah, right. So, so you just kind of adopted over. these guys just because of lo- like like the, the very where they were at. Yeah, and maybe maybe some of that might not have happened that way had we not all been sharing that building. A Mars studio was down the hall. It was all just right place, right time. Yeah. So so when you guys decided to form Mushroom Head, what was the idea behind that? Like what, like because at the time. That whole two vocal thing was really just kind of like not. It didn't. It wasn't like it became like now. Everyone, everyone's got the two vocal thing. But till, you, till we got Jay, I was just singing as many different ways as possible, and there was a lot of different things going on between like elevation and forty three. Just trying whatever I felt like trying at the time, and um, we actually started with forty three, and I sang into a, a bike megaphone, and we had a speaker inside a big gulp cup. We were just trying, like, any weird things we could do. And um, it kind of, like, would always made sense to have another singer, but that really evolved once Jay came in and sang Eagle Trip, and we would just both get the idea we had going and both record our version of it, and then we'd just have things that were just magically happening at the same time. Really? And it just – and it did it, did it feel like – Chemically, it was happening like yeah, that it was way. Like where... all totally organic, and um, I really wish the band had stayed that way because it got to a point where I'd sing to this point, and then he'd sing, and then I'd sing again. And I thought there was really a charm to the band when we just had these happy accidents happening of both vocalists going at the same time, making something really cool. Like, like the song uh, "These Filthy Hands" is a perfect example. Like, 
we're both just going. Yeah, right. And they both just fit in our spots, and it worked really well. Yeah, man, that's 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 so cool. And and one thing about your voice that I, I mean, this is my personal opinion, I guess, but like as far as like you guys doing this thing where it wasn't just music, it was like a horror movie. Every you guys brought everything to it. You had this like haunting voice. You had this very specific sounding very unique voice that you had that almost sounded like you were possessed almost like it was like this, like you had this thing and it, and to me it's kind of defined the mushroom head thing. Like you could hear the mushroom heads, you could hear the song start and everything. But once Jeff starts singing, it's like, Oh, it's mushroom head. It's just really weird because, um, especially at the place on 82 filthy hand studios, whatever you want to call it. I would feel like I was channeling someone else sometimes when I was tracking. Really? And it didn't happen all the time, but there would just be moments where I, I felt like it was going on. And I just always thought my deep, resonant voice was, like, just something different than I didn't hear everywhere. No, you don't. It's a, like I say, I think it's – it's an, and it's not just deep. It's just – it's got a certain tone. It's yeah. almost like a haunting – like, it, like it, 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 it so fits what this is all about. It was just like, you know, and, and for what it's worth, you and J-Man, for whatever, to me – the sounds of your voices going, it was, it just, it was perfect. Yeah. It was like the perfect everything and, going and, on. And I think that's part of the evolution that changes everything because um, after a certain point, Jay basically did not want to rap anymore. And that's how 10,000 Cadillacs was born. And like these offshoots to conviction, unified culture existed already, but there was things that weren't hap- happening after a certain point in mushroom hood. And it made it a less like, yeah. How are you not going to rap any more mushroom? That was one of our strengths. Yeah, right. It's what, it's what I, I just don't understand why that all happened. I thought it should have kept well, going the way it had been. And then he ends up leaving the band, yeah, actually, yeah. because, it, and I, and if I'm not mistaken, what I heard had something to do with his father. There's really um, a few few um, actual stories out there. Anecdotes of what happened. I think it was a basically a bottom line of he didn't think he was being heard enough, like, like I said, we used to com- compete for parts. And as a vocalist writer, you're pretty passionate about what you're giving this song and hoping it goes in it. And some, there was something along the way of uh, Twisted was mad about him looking just like them and they wanted to fight. Like all these all these different things kept coming up because we were supposedly going to go on a tour with ICP. And after we, he had left, that tour fell through. Oh, I see. There was just different things that were brought up as the reason and that probably played a part of it or was a big part of it. I don't, I don't really know exactly what happened, but having lived that life completely for years beyond after he left, I, I get it. <laughs> so then you guys get Waylon to come in and, and after yeah. he leaves, right? Now how did that, how was that process? We were, we were on tour and we were playing his hometown and his, his local band at the time was opening for us. And Jay actually said that night, if I ever quit, you guys should get him. Oh, and, um, Things went on, and um, we toured again, and they opened for us again. And then uh, I think he, I believe he was invited up to hang out or something. And um, back in the day, we opened, or we played with a band called Twenty Dead Flower Children, and they had ended up breaking up. And that guy was kind of like Jay Junior to me from when we had played together. And and I thought he would have been a good guy to look at, but Waylon just clicked in it, and that's where the path we went. Yeah, he and he he. I mean, he he is a talented guy too. I mean, he's got he's got a good singing voice. He's got the good thing. But th- that being said, I just I still don't think it was the same as just when you and Jay yeah, were there, doing. There's it. people that just never wanted to give him a break. And seems like a nice guy too. I've seen some interviews with him. Yeah, nice dude. Seems like too. He's doing like his own thing and it's gaining strength now. And, and um, I'm still you still in touch with him? You still in contact with him at all? Yeah, we're we're, we're friends. We're kind of acquaintances. We don't chill all the time or yeah, I talk you. all the time we talk when we talk it's not a bad relationship it's just when you're in the band with the person it's more than it is after you're not anymore yeah so so mushroom head at this point like like, like well, this is all going on but you, you guys are still growing at an exponential rate i mean mushroom head got so big you know and i don't know that everybody locally understands just how big mushroom head was i still think you know there's in cleveland it's a funny thing and especially after doing the show you kind of realize this is that Local people treat local bands here differently for yeah. whatever reason. It's a mindset like where it, people just automatically put shelve you because you, for some reason you're from Cleveland or something that doesn't. Yeah. Do you it know is a, that it is like a um, every man for himself uh, survival of the fittest 
situation a little more. And I don't, I don't really know about a lot of national scenes, how they work. There's a lot of love between bands. If you're in those groups that are loved by each other, it, um, breaker. I heard years later, their management said, don't even talk to us. So you, you don't even know what's all behind all of it all the time. But, um, Having tracked at Mars Studio and a lot of a lot of local bands have, Bill Kirk, you would always tell us that other bands would be like, "Why them? How come not us? Why them?" Like, oh yeah, we uh, we just busted our ass and we'd stay up all night cutting CD covers out for the first version of self titled, thousand of them, and it's like if you're not DIY and don't survive on your own without all these other people coming in the picture and helping, you're going to be just another band that tried to make it out of cleveland so do you is that is that what you think a lot of this has to do with though like you like when you form these bands the ones that actually do make it it's not just based on their merit and their and their their ability to play like there's there's a certain work ethic that everybody in the band kind of has to have for this to work out is yeah, that it's kind of like it's kind of like actually evolved into even more prevalent now that you have to have that because you got to have a social media presence you got to Talk to the fans. I'm I'm guilty of not really doing as much as I should be. I just not the blog guy. Ninety percent of the time, I just like more just having a conversation in ty- in type at this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit of a I'm not an agoraphobic, but I'm a bit leaning that way. I now find out that Mike Patton is one, so which which is pretty crazy. <laughs> but um, you you just gotta like push yourself even more because it's not even today. It's not even about record sales. It's about internet presence. Well, and, and, and being able to stand out amongst thousands of bands that are all doing, trying somewhat the same thing, and it's who works the hardest who's going to get to the top first. I yeah, guess. and even back in that day, there would be the North Coast Buzzard Tracks records. There would be uh, 107.3 before it became uh, whatever station backing all these bands, and there would be, like, Cleveland's Darling. Like, I remember the name Fifth Wheel as an example, but um, we were like that black sheep of the local family, so that probably – was a little bit of what these bands were always wondering why them and not us. Was there was there like a, a time in, in, during the Mushroom Head thing where you were working with like this is this is my favorite this like did you have a certain writer that you were like this is this was my favorite writer in the band because you guys had a lot you guys had a lot of different guys come in and go along the way was there one that you wish actually I love JJ because he was all over map style wise you never knew what the next riff was going to be because. Um, I wasn't really friend friends with Gravy. He he's more of the stoner rock world, super heavy, which is good. I'm not knocking his writing at all, but I like more of the all over the map. I, I look at JJ like a kind of like a Dave Navarro vibe. Like you never knew what he was gonna do either. And Jane's and um, Tommy is like JJ in a sense, but he's even more. He just knows his instrument even that much more and can give you any style you want as far as a song you want to write to. And um, Actually, it was probably Tommy, and oddly enough, we left that band a day apart. Yeah, that's a, that did happen that way. You you were first. Were you the first one? Because I yeah, remember when that. And, I remember when he, you. He felt kind of bad about doing it. He didn't want to have a lot of backlash, but I was like, because he, he was actually leaving the band before I did. There would be like these big brawls on the bus emotionally and. Uh, one day he's gonna fly home. And I'm like, please just stay, man. I can't take this out here without you. So, so. Did, did that did that conversation ever take place though between you two when you, when when you guys both knew that you guys were gonna kind of like depart? Was it like, hey, let's leave, but when we do, let's let's do something? Yeah, we um even prior to leaving, we were working on a band that was called Doom Candy, and I'll probably go back to the name eventually for some stuff I put out. But a, a consultant of mine told me I really wanted to con. Um, concentrate on one name, so that's why I roll with Jeffrey Nothing instead of pursuing using Doom Candy at this time. But we were already doing songs for that project while, while we were still in that band. And then, and then you decided to just say drop the, the Doom Candy and just just make it Jeffrey Nothing. Yeah, I even thought of going do, Jeffrey Nothing's Doom Candy, but that's like you don't want people to read a cycle encyclopedia while they're saying your name. <laughs> your title of the band. <laughs> so, so yeah. So then, so then, you decided to to keep to maintain the whole horror film type thing, though. That you know, you decided like to take it. And I mean, my personal thing is, 
Was it was this kind of like fuck you guys? I'll do it better than you, or was this just something you loved so much you just didn't want to change? You're kind of carrying that in the back of your mind, and had things gone different, had I not left with the clothes on my back, maybe I wouldn't have that mindset. Had I not heard from a lot of people I trust that I'm blacklisted to this day by them, maybe I wouldn't be going with the, rolling with that. But I also helped build that, and I'm start. I started from scratch again. My biggest number on my any of my songs on youtube is 700 and something thousand or on spotify qwerty has probably 45 million views and i helped make that yeah so what happened i mean how, how like how does it how did it get to that point where i mean you were like for a while you like you were one of the faces of the band you started yeah, almost there, there's people that say i am and was mushroom Ed. my own drummer along the way told me it was my band so um I truly believe that he hates the thought of anyone else in that band having a fan. Like, he wants it to all be because of him. All right, we've got to take a quick break. I don't want to, but we have to. When we come back in a few minutes with Jeff or Nothing. Cleveland. I am ZM Delgado, author of the Rust Belt Rock Review at ZachOLantern.com, and this is your weekend concert calendar update. First on our agenda, Friday the 10th at the Grog Shop, it is Disintegration, with special guests JD, Honolulu High, and Simon in the Apparatus. Second up, it is Saturday 11th at No Class, it's Nun Slaughter, with special guests Burial Oath, Hellkite, and Necro Prophecy, and there it is. Two great shows in one weekend, Cleveland. I hope to see you out there. Until next time, rock on Rust Belt. Hi everybody, it's DJ Terry from the Homegrown Hit Show on 2160 Beat Radio with your list of rockin' events for the week. Starting on Wednesday, March 8th, it's Brian Allen Hager and he's at the winery at Wolf Creek out in Barberton. And then on Friday, March 10th, we have the Fallout near Shaker's Tavern. Best of our Saints are going to be at Darmo's Cafe. Buzz Baldrin's at Coda. Tricky Dick and the Cover Up's going to be over at Time Warp in, in Westlake. Fatback Mango will be over at the 5 o'clock lounge in Lakewood. And then on Saturday night, March 11th, it's for Absent Friends, and they're going to be at the Vortex in Akron. So check them out. Whatever you do, keep sporting local music, and keep rocking with me on the Homegrown Hit Show every Monday night. This is DJ Terry, and I'm out. And we are back here, everybody, with Jeffrey Nothing. Another thing I noticed about you, which I, Pat and I were just actually talking about this the other day, which makes you unique and cool, is you're a huge Cleveland sports fan. Oh, yeah. Like, huge. I've, like, I've thought about doing a podcast, a uh, heavy metal sports talk or something. Really? And, and I, I've never actually gone there, but I, I feel like I could. And I don't know, like, I'm not entirely versed in three technique, five technique, all that. All <laughs> you don't that have to be. I, I read what you put. But uh, I'm very passionate about it. And um, uh, someone along the way of meeting me, their father asked after we had talked for a second, does he know what he's talking about? And the guy said, yeah, he's an encyclopedia. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. For some right. reason, I, I would read Transition Wire in the morning and see what the Browns did or just the NFL period, see who's, who's available. And um, I just care a lot. And, and I feel like, I don't know, J.B. Bickerstaff to me is like the wrong voice because that team is zero discipline. And it's like I call them junk shots. They get killed by all these terrible junk shots. And it's like, go to the hole. <laughs> yeah, I will never be a Guardians fan. I love the team, but I just can't. The name is just not right, and that that whole change never needed to happen. It was a money grab of a new rebranding. There was really never any outcry of this is bad. Getting rid of Chief Wahoo should have been plenty, and there's way worse out there. Awesome. And what do you think about the Browns? While, while we're at it, might as well go I there. I think too. that um, 
anyone that wants to act like Deshaun isn't the answer and we should have kept Brissett. Brissett's a journeyman for a reason. He was five to ten feet away from receivers in the first few games, a la Brian Hoyer. And um, when he was having a good game, which his stats are covered by, like bulk of the games were good until those desperation, I'm pressing too hard picks that kill three games. And if you want to act like Deshaun got a fair shot, he did not. He came into the season with a 4-7 and seven record or whatever it was, and it was already, for all intents yeah. and purposes, over. Yeah, right. People he had to be absolutely perfect to give us a shot. And the quarterback is not the problem. He can't throw it and catch it. And there was definitely moments where he was under pressure where he escaped it, where Brissett would have been on his back or anybody else. And um I love that Woods is gone. It should have happened after a year or two for sure, if not even one. And why they can act like they can just grab any to play Anyone that played defensive tackle is ridiculous. And they had a shot at Sue, who at one point wanted to come here. But Andrew Barry are not smarter than everybody else. <laughs> awesome, dude. Why don't why don't you get the podcast going, dude? This is what we need to hear. I mean, I will. I, I would love to. I just, I um. Maybe we'll need, talk. Maybe we'll a, talk need about a blast off point. Like I can't. I, I would like to have some kind of. So, I mean, Cleveland sports media needs an enema. I'd like to get support from somebody that I love to do like a Garrett Bush show. G Bush Sunday in the middle of the day, whatever. Give me five minutes. I I just like a jumping off point. I guess I'm saying. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's what you're great at doing is the rant. Like you're great at this rant thing. Even yeah. when you just put it in words and you're writing it out, I can hear your voice reading it and I'm like, this is great shit right here. You have a great opinions on things and you're and you're educated on this too. Yeah, you're not just it's spewing. weird because when you try to talk sense, like I'm on Bleacher Report, I try to talk sense. People are like, why is everything out of your mouth negative? Because there's a lot to say about what's wrong with the situations, all three of them. And we had this song in, in Mushroom Head. I actually wrote all the lyrics. It was called Erase the Doubt. And it goes, come down from your throne and tear off your wings. Uh, I forget all my lyrics sometimes, but it's basically saying, can you erase the doubt and make this more than a dream? And I feel like all of Cleveland sports should just join together and use it as their fight song. Like, There it is. It, it, there's just the passion seemed to be lacking a little bit. And for the secondary, they'll all be like looking at each other like, wasn't it supposed to be you? It's, oh. Be a, be an M and F and ball hawk and just go to the ball. I don't care what spot on the field you're playing. Run a little faster. I like it. I like it. Fuck yeah, dude. Dude, I mean, like, we touched on some of the stuff with the Purgatory interview, too, where, because you had started with, actually, you started doing cover songs in, in a cover band, not even in Cleveland, before, before. yeah. You, you I actually, actually recently shared a flyer from 1983, Kenny Easterly and I are in it because I drew it. And then we had a band prior to Purgatory called NI for an I, but it was spelled the letter N, the letter I, the number four, and then NI again. Oh. And um, we had like five sets of metal covers. We had a couple of originals we were working on right before I left to move to Louisiana for a year and a half, whatever, before Purgatory. And, um, we were. They asked us that Biggie's to be their house band, which was crazy because now it's gone. It's like a parking garage or something. Yeah. But um. Yeah, that band. Uh, that band was really interesting, and we did. Uh, we even did this, when we first started to try and make Purgatory. We were doing like riot songs and um, just a lot of covers and that before we got the right lineup. Um, and then. My Hatrix days were strange. Uh, as that band was falling apart a little bit, uh, we did a show trade with a cover band from Detroit called Bloodshot, and we went up there to play with them first, and they were all covers. And it was like $5 pitcher night or something. And we get up there, we're playing our originals, and the crowd's like this at their table. <laughs> and it's like, what the hell? And... uh so we had this Metallica medley. We would play like a couple seconds to each song and then end with Creeping Death. And Gravy, Dave Fallon was like, we got to play it. They're going to love it. And then Skinny and I were like, nah, we're doing I Don't Care About You, Fuck You by Fear. So we start the song. The bass player playing it. The drummer's playing it. And I'm singing it. Gravy's like this, pointing at me and Skinny the whole song. Never once played an instrument. What? 
<laughs> yeah, that's how special and loving that was. <laughs> and and that and that's what that was toward the end. You said of Hatrix, this was like, this was like, that was like, probably like, that was probably like wow. maybe a year before it just dissolved and became Mushroom Head in that sense. And what's funny, we we still had the show trade in Cleveland night set up for that band to come down and play with us. And their drummer showed up and said, sorry, but they weren't coming. (laughs) (laughs) Crazy shit, man. So what, you know, like, what's it like real quick? Like, like, you know, like you've been, like you said, Hatrix was more of a regional thing. Purgatory was more local. Hatrix was more regional. And then Mushroom Red became international. What, you know, like, what do you notice as you're learning, because this is like a, you know, you had to learn, like there, you, this, there's a lot of firsts through all these things, right? Like you're, especially when you, sp- you start becoming more of a national, international thing. What are some of the things that you really hated about it? Like, like, like what were some of the things that like, you know, it's, it's always glamorized and it's always, you know, trying to build up, but it's not all glamor and it's a lot of work involved. What did you, what did you despise the most like about that thing that you did um, through that? It's it's crazy because Mushroom Head probably would have stayed somewhat regional, but we got a record deal with a label called Eclipse, and um, there was some interest there, and we did like a little more things, getting to them ourselves, but there still wasn't any prospect of real tour. And then, as all those records were outselling everything else locally, Universal started to take notice, and they had a guy coming out and starting to watch us. And um, right right before that time, oddly enough, we were offered to sign with Roadrunner by Monty Connor. And he he offered us ten grand, which we were making more than that, just doing a little weekend run. And Roadrunner, that was like King Diamond and all them guys, right? They yeah, were yeah. And then he wanted to give us ten grand or twenty grand, something like that, just not enough. And then he wanted every bit of our merch. Oh. And we're selling a boatload of merch at all our shows alone. And had it gone national, it would have skyrocketed even more. So we said no, and they made that S band, which I now the don't S hate. Band. I, I, I used to hate that band with a passion. Now I don't mind them. Now it's like, oh really? Yeah. And Corey Taylor's strangely band. Right? Enough, we were trying to uh, a couple fans, and I were trying to make a make the Slipknot Mushroom Head tour happen. And uh, it got a lot of people in the group and everything, and there were stickers made of filthy maggots. And um, and it just never was going to happen because their management, management, which is clown, basically, would always have said no. And what's weird is we did a show once in Des Moines, and clown and his wife walked past our bus going in one direction and back, and it was definitely him, and no one ever said a word. No shit. And, um... um so, so it, it, that's a true story. So the story about Slipknot and you guys is true. Then that you guys were first. You guys, you guys turned down this offer, and so they went and just said, "Fine, we'll just." Yeah, they Google. really didn't. They didn't all wear masks. Like the drummer had the clown mask between his bass drums. One guy had a bunch of piercings and put guitar strings through them. Runner, runner brought in Corey Taylor. They let Anders go and brought in Corey Taylor, and. um a friend of mine actually became good friends with them. And, the, and I quote, what was I supposed to do? Turn down a million dollars. They signed non-disclosure agreements not to talk about it. One of their ex-tour managers was out on a tour with somebody, and we ended up playing a little one-off like festival night, Il Nino, Cold Chamber. Somebody he was with, he supposedly hid in a road case because he thought we were going to beat his ass. <laughs> Didn't even know what he looked like. But... um. So then, yeah, like, after that fizzled out, Universal, I believe, thought they might catch lightning in a bottle just having a band that was similar. So they signed us. What's weird is we signed our contract in a hotel that's no longer there that already kind of had a curse. A couple on their wedding night died of, of um, like, Car exhaust or whatever. Oh, uh, like carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah, on their wedding night in that hotel, it's gone now. It's a empty lot on Berea Road and or Bagley Road in Berea. Oh, the uh, Middleburg Heights. But we met the label there, and then we signed it on our bus. Officially signed the contract on nine eleven. Oh my! So these are like omens almost, but um, 
the label really wanted to make their own record with us because Double X was a compilation of our first three. So they were all excited to put out 13. That really nice guy I keep bringing up, he turned down every idea for a promo they came up with. So they basically dropped us before Sun Doesn't Rise even hit radio. And that was the end of being on a major label. So so now you're now you're doing the Jeffrey Nothing thing, yeah. right? All that's in the past now, but basically. You got a lot going on. You got a lot on your plate. You're 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 dealing with a lot of things back at home. You got you know, you're you just got all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah. But this thing is still happening, man. You're still you're you're here right now, you're dressed up, you're doing it, right? Yeah. New music. Now it's been a while since you guys released something, right? I mean it's, um, it's been a little while. It was October fourteenth, I believe. We put out a thousand years. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. called eight thousand years or a thousand years, depending on where you find it. Um I just got my Tommy was here for a day. I just got my home Pro Tools rig fully going the way it's supposed to, because we talk on the phone, I made some notes and I'd have something missing, but I tracked with uh uh Mr. Gray, I did a song with him a while back, American Meat Grinder, out of my own home, and then I sent them the tracks. And uh, we had, we had a moment where we were thinking we were going to work with this other guy, so I kind of laid off doing the home stuff and forgot a few things. And then, like I said, Tommy was there, and I uh, did a cover of Painted Black. Like we slowed it down a little bit, and I made it more industrial. And it's with Dead by Wednesday, cool. and uh, the guitarist from Jasta's. Um, I guess producing and play guitar on it. So that that was pretty fun. And um uh we probably have five songs I'm ready to track right now that I've gotten from Tommy recently. And then we probably have fifteen at least songs that we haven't released yet that are in demo form. And he just sent me a twelve song, even heavier record to start working on. Sweet, man. So so it's rolling. You guys are about to start. Yeah, we got a stack of stuff. So, real quick, I want to go over the guys that are in the band because, you know, you're the only one here rep- right now representing him, and you bring up Tommy a lot. So, that's Tommy Church. Yeah. And he play- he plays guitars, and he also can play some keyboard, and he can play bass, and he does a lot of things for it because he's right. Yeah, he up- sends me complete songs. He oh, really? He does the drum programming until we're ready to have Noah play the live. Okay. And that's the uh, that's Noah Shark. Yep. He's a drummer. And Steven Adams is your bass player. Yeah. And Ian D is the other, Ian D is the other vocalist that, yeah. That uh, like Mushroom had had the two vocalists. Like I said, you're, you're this is this is kind of like a, a derivative of Mushroom Head. Yeah, and hopefully it gets bigger. It's kind of like better. a. It's almost like why would I have stopped that when I co-created it, and it's where I came from even before that band, like yeah. horror movies, giving the fans more of a show than just guys standing up there banging their head. Yeah, you guys, you know, like, I can only refer to the Mushroom Head Live thing, really, but, when you know, watching you guys up there, one thing that was really interesting to me was how well you guys did the visual thing. The acting part, okay? Like, like you guys looked scary sometimes, right? You guys had the whole, like, you know, like horror movies use certain little tricks and stuff to make things scarier, the whole head shaking thing, you know? You guys, you guys did, you guys took to that. It was kind of like a... What each person brought, I um, I just thought it's more majestic to kind of be in one place, and I I just the head shake just happened because when I, I looked at it as everybody banging their head saying yes, I'm saying no, my name's Jeffrey, no thing. Yeah, um, right. So it just happened out of the course of of doing it, and I, I I always thought like the same token of where to me heavier music is heavier if you have some softer stuff mixed in than always heavy 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 yeah and to me on stage it was cooler if i had my spot and kind of lurk there and let everybody else jump around and stage dive and it was whatever it, else it was totally that was the that and, was the vibe and, and the thing was also i was totally a different look 90 95 percent of the time than the rest of the band so why not be a different presence yeah, because I think everybody jumping around banging their head, whatever it is, that's what they're doing now. What to me that gets old. Yeah. So when you guys are writing tunes, Tommy's writing basically the most. He's, it's, the ideas are coming through him a lot of times, and then he gives them to you, and then you kind of put the polish and stuff on this, and the words and the lyrics. And yeah. do you write the lyrics to his music? Is that how you guys do it? Yeah, or? and and it's really cool because along the way, I always would contribute my idea, and that would be the song, and then. 
uh, along the way it became, I want you to sing like this here and this here. And then that to like kill my soul as far as my creative juices in a way. And now with Jeffrey, nothing, it's all what I contribute again. So, so was it like that in mushroom head? Like after a while, once you guys get to a point where you're so big, you, you're almost, you, you have ideas, you're writing them, but then somebody has to always come in there and then tweak. It's, it's not really true because to this day, Solitaire and Raveling is one of our biggest songs, and that was the, the song that happened. There was no, we got to go by this formula. You, when, once you start going at it, trying to make a hit, you're probably going to end up with less. Yeah, that, right, exactly, right? I mean, that's what that's what happens is you start getting these influences, people who think they know more and they yeah. think they understand something, and it, it takes away from what got you there to begin yeah. with. Yeah, and, and part of the beauty of that, that other band was there was a lot of people there, so there was a lot of points of views and opinions that were contributing to what was working, and then it became like, no, it's my show. It's over. Yeah. And that, it was over, I feel like. I can't listen to a new record, and I never will. Jeffrey, nothing. But, um, the situation is we're all we all love each other and um, come from the light instead of the dark. Because oddly, things started to get like even purposely way, way, way beyond dark on the other world. And um, I I still uh, go with the stark, brutal vision of what the world's really like, but my message is positive. Yeah, you're right. No, you got it's. I I I always look at it what you guys do, especially you, it's, it's like, you're presenting this, like, it's like a horror flick. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, it's it, guys that make horror movies aren't devil worshipers necessarily no. or and, anything and, like and that. Like I said, like the state of the world isn't exactly a nice place. No. Like and, and it's, you guys, every also, man for himself, care about yourself. Community really doesn't exist. Caring is like, I got to do that. No way. Yeah. And, and let's just be honest, like the bottom line with this whole thing too, all that all stuff matters, but this is just fucking fun. Right. I mean, like you guys have fun doing all this stuff. Yeah. It's Halloween. Every time you guys go out there and you can be something different, you can hide behind these masks. You can do that horror thing and, and, and make people kind of freaking out. And it, it's it's a totally different vibe, you know, like kiss, kiss and Alice Cooper, Alice Cooper's probably oh, the yeah. granddad 18, of all this stuff. Right. Birthday, I was right there. Yeah. Oh yeah, third song was eighteen. Yeah. Rich Coliseum. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like, Alice Cooper was like the—he's the daddy of all this kind of stuff yeah. like that. But you guys took it to a whole nother level, and and you know, really, besides maybe Slipknot, there's really not a lot of this. You like, you would think some other bands would give it a try, but really, I haven't seen it, and I you don't, you don't see a lot of this. You guys kind of like are, are, are doing it, and nobody else. Would yeah, you agree? I mean, I mean, you don't see it. Did you expect that a little bit? Did you think that once you guys started seeing success with the masks and, and doing all that, that we would just start seeing? I mean, we we do. I get that. There are some. I see a couple here and there, or, or, or maybe one or two guys are wearing masks and stuff. But I really thought it would it would be something that you would see more and more of because of the... I think that people are really trying to do it in a professional way and um and try to do it different. I think, I think there's some copycats, and I don't blame them, whatever you think might make make you notice get you noticed but i think i think anyone trying to do this should really try to make it their own like i i have ideas i want to do down the road i need to find a welder that wants to work with me and um i just want to make the live show a little bit different and there there's only so many ways you can i think taking it off of the person and making it objects you see the people through might be the way to go now and I'm, I'm looking to do something like that because e even this kind of thing does get overplayed a bit and i just had a new mask made i'm lucky enough to have a new guy i'm working with and he's going to do the whole band and it's an idea i had prior to my hand and finger mask and um it's really really awesome and it's going to be interchanging as far as the parts of it. it's actually six different face pieces my new mask. Really? Yeah. So how long like, does it take that, you to do something like that before a gig? It, it, if it was got... like a couple of conversations, but um, it's like different races, different ages, different sexes, whatever I feel like putting in the panels. We're going to change them up. Like the one panel right here on it is a beauty makeup panel, and then this one's rotted flesh. and <laughs> It's just like six different things going on. And I'm always looking to take it to the next place instead of staying comfortable where I'm at. And it's going to be cool because all the guys are talking to them and they're getting their own masks made. And we've been in a level of 
just picking what we could find and now we're going to have like a signature look again and and it's going to always still evolve do you do you feel like you have that artistic ability outside of music also where that the whole visual thing is up your alley also you're creative in that in that way where like these ideas that that's come to you are original to you and yeah i've always um been in the art world i draw a lot i ended up being into where i like drawing logos more than people or anything that i used to draw when i was younger but um i think if you're artistic, it usually is Crosses kind of all-encompassing. I wish I had been able to play an instrument. Lord knows I carried a very large bass guitar case a couple miles to my lesson for a long time, and it never really stuck. It's like how many guys can teach you how to play cocaine or smoke on the water without <laughs> teaching you really how to play the instrument, but that was me. But <laughs> right. um I'm just glad I cross over, and I've actually even done a couple movies. There's one that's not out yet called Dead Quiet that I'm pretty proud of, and some of the other ones, other ones I'm a little bit, little bit getting to where I wanted to be, but not quite there. But it's when you just, say you're in movies, what do you mean? What do you what, you're acting in? Them? Yeah, I've done a couple acting in them, and um, one I actually I feel like I'm a poster in the background because they don't. I'm like my. Character title, I think, is Club Vampire, but I'm in the background. I might as well have been a poster. But um, <laughs> Dead Quiet, I feel like, is really cool. And what was cool is Kip Weeks, who was in The Strangers, which is an international big hit. He's the good guy lead, and I'm the bad guy. And one day, hopefully, I'll see the light of day. When do you think, do you think that'll be out within the year? Or do you think people um, can see it this? It was supposedly coming in 2016 on the original <laughs> version of the sort of movie poster. But there's been issues with... Um, the score and just the sound period. And I'm, I'm hoping it's remedied soon and it does come out. How, how long do you think before the new music comes out? How long do you think that people got to wait before they'll start to be able to hear some of that? The music? Yeah. The stuff you said you had like five songs that you guys would be working um, on. How long is that? You, will um, that? Like I said, there's probably 15 in the can or demos. Oh, you got that many. And, um, um, uh, Noah just played live drums on a song called pretending alive. And that should be, a month at the most. Are you going to be do, doing that as releasing singles? Is that is that is that the plan? I mean, or? it's kind of like the the program nowadays. You're supposed to release every so often, or if you're not doing it, some of the formats threaten to drop you. I guess, but um, we we just actually made some connections recently, and I'm going to guest on another band song again. And I don't want to get into the full details yet, but um, one of the members of that band, and creators of it, has started the chain of put me in contact with the producer has done a ton of huge work and he's supposedly interested. So I believe a full record will be within six, seven months. Oh, great. That's awesome. If that long. And then a tour would follow. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we're still figuring out the tour part because, um, Tommy has two young daughters and he, Told me he, was, he he almost was in a beer, but he had to go home. He wanted to go home because it's his mom's birthday today, and he missed fifteen while he was on tour. Oh yeah, and it's just like with the state of the world, everybody has or four out of five of us have serious full time jobs, or three out of five, whatever whatever it is. But it's just not as easy to jump and tour. And we did like a four or five show run a few years back, dancing around or. Uh, avoiding tornadoes as much as possible. We went through like three states that had like a hundred tornadoes between them. <laughs> oh Somehow God. we dodged them all. And then we were in like, I like the East coast played a few shows over there. But um, with, like I said, without a vehicle, it's just my wife's still paying off credit cards, five grand, whatever. Oh yeah. It's without so a, a tour, you're talking like a tour bus or something to actually yeah, drive around. I, I just want like a sprinter or, any kind of van like that that we can use for them. I'm thinking about trading my car and just having a tour vehicle or going camping vehicle. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, well, I, I think we're going to be looking out for for the new stuff, man, and and, and all that. A couple, yeah. nine, eight, nine months, dude. Um, we'll definitely be up updating people, you know, and, and we'll stay in touch with you and let you can keep yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, we have 10 songs that have come out since I left the other band, and I would like to actually make hard copies of that and then working with that new guy. We yeah. probably got, we probably got three albums. I'd like to put a 
double album out, but make it separate. Like release one and like a week or a month later, release the other. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, keep, keep an eye out for it guys. Jeffrey, nothing man. And, uh, Fucking awesome that you came in. I, I really appreciate, man, you coming in and doing Thank all this. Thank you. Man. I appreciate it, too, and it's really a great time. Yeah. All right, guys. Keep an eye out. We'll be in touch. We'll see you guys next week. See you later. That'll be fine. <laughs>